Hello Brain Shakers, Brave Alistair is here from the Brain Shakers Academy. In today's session we're going to be looking at some of the abnormalities of the placenta. But before we dive into the abnormalities of the placenta, let's quickly look at the placenta at 10. Now I have drawn two diagrams here just to help us understand the placenta at 10. So when we look at this first diagram, you will notice that this is going to be the umbilical cord and then you have the placenta here and the membrane coming down here obviously the amnion and the chorion the one on the inner part because this is the maternal surface the one on the inner part is going to be the chorion and the one on the outer side is going to be the amnion because when you turn this round and are looking at it from this end those membranes then will be roping down like that Meaning that what is attached more or closer to the maternal surface is going to be the chorion. And then in the inner part, you have the amnion there and the um, the uh, umbilical cord down there. So the fetal surface is obviously going to look uh, shiny and you have blood vessels there that you can visibly see showing you that obviously from the placenta side itself, there's been a lot that has been supplied to the fetus that is in terms of oxygenation and the nutrition value as well. Now, if you're looking at the maternal surface, you find that you have these divisions here that separate the maternal part of the placenta into parts that we call the cotyledon. So these parts are called cotyledons or lobes. Okay, now the lobes are separated by the grooves that appear here or placenta septums that we actually call sulci. So those are called the sulci because they separate those cotyledons. And in a tame placenta, you tend to note about 16 to about 20 of those cotyledons onto the maternal surface. Now, as you look at the maternal surface, there's usually in the last four weeks of a pregnancy, there's deposition of fibrin. So you may notice that it is going to appear a little bit gritty on that area because of the deposition of uh, the fibrin itself. But then there are also other conditions and other situations such as in somebody who is a heavy or chronic smoker, uh, people that have uh, diabetes mellitus and people that have gone beyond term that is post 42 weeks, you find that the deposition of those fibrin um, uh, deposits here becomes a little bit more extensive thereby reducing the sufficiency and the efficiency of the uh, placenta itself in providing the relevant nutrition to the uh, fetus during utero times. Now we say that from about the 16th week towards uh, the rest of the pregnancy the villi itself that is in the placenta tends to thin because there is a huge demand in terms of oxygen and nutrition that is required by the growing fetus. But in the last four weeks of pregnancy, you will find that because of the deposition of the fibrin uh, around the placenta, then that process now of getting all the nutrients and the oxygen then reduces, and that is what would be contributing to placenta insufficiency. Now, we have looked at this particular part. This is the maternal surface, and then this will obviously be the uh, fetal surface. Now, there are times when the placenta has a cord that is inserted not in the central portion. So we say that the normal situation or the normal situation of the placenta should be in the upper uterine segment, but sometimes it will uh, implant itself into the lower uh, uh, portion. That will obviously be a placenta previa. But you have a placenta here. And sometimes you find that the cord is inserted centrally. That is a central insertion. That's absolutely fine. Sometimes you find that instead of being inserted into the central portion, this umbilical cord will be inserted into the marginal areas or into the lateral aspect. That will be a lateral insertion. Now, there are certain times when you find that the umbilical cord itself is not inserted into the center, it is not inserted into the lateral aspect, but it is inserted on the edge of the uh, placenta that is referred to as a battle door insertion. 
Okay, that's a butter dough insertion. There's absolutely nothing wrong with having a butter dough insertion, but if you are delivering this placenta, the chances of having a retained placenta here are very high because this can actually snap there and leave the placenta well attached into the uterus there, and then you have to go and do some manual removal of that uh, retained placenta. So that would be a butter dough insertion. But then there are times when the cord is not even inserted on the center into the lateral aspect or on the margins or on the end as a butter dough insertion but it is inserted in the membrane so the cord is inserted into the membranes and then has blood vessels now that are emanating from that area going to uh, the placenta this will be what we call uh, velamentosa so this is a velamentosa insertion where the cord is actually inserting into the membranes. So those are abnormalities of cord insertion where the cord finds itself inserted into uh, different uh, positions. Okay, now having looked at that, there are times when you also have a placenta that appears to be two placentas uh, formed. So you have your umbilical cord there, and then you have a placenta there, and then you have something that looks like this. It may be referred to as a bilobed placenta or a placenta bipartita. So bipartita buy from just two because it appears to have two lobes uh two placenta lobes there are times where you find that they will appear as three and then you just call that as a tripartita okay so sometimes these lobes of placenta may appear as having one uh, umbilical cord and in certain instances you find that they'll have an umbilical cord that is joining and each will then have a branch of those um, of the umbilical cord that then emanates to come in and meet as one. Very rare conditions, but they are conditions that can also be identified as you look at the placenta. Now, if you have a bipartita and you have a tripartita, sometimes you have a well-formed placenta and then end up having a lobe of a placenta. Okay, so you have a placenta down here, which is... Uh, which is a well-formed placenta and then you have vessels crossing over and then you have a tiny little placenta on the other side. This is what we call a placenta saccenturiate or saccenturiata. Okay, saccenturiata. Okay, or saccenturiate. So this is a placenta saccenturiate because it has an extra lobe of placenta from the main placenta. Now, having had a placenta saccenturiate, sometimes you find that the membranes themselves, they are folding themselves around the fetal surface before they actually drop down. So you have your umbilical cord here and then you have the placenta. You obviously have the membranes down here where you have the chorion and the amnion. And remember that this area where the baby exited is what we refer to as the fenestrum. Okay. Now, once uh, these membranes, before they actually come down here, they can actually roll back like this before they come down. So you find something like this before these membranes come down. So they are going round, they rope back like that before they actually come down. If you were to hold the placenta through the umbilical cord, you will notice on the placenta, uh, the fetal surface aside uh, that the membranes are kind of roping around. You can even push in a finger in here and try to separate those membranes from the fetal surface. Then when they are covering the uh, circumference, this is called a placenta circumvalata. So in other literature, you find it is circumvalate. 
but it's a placenta circumvalata because it is covering the entire uh, circumference. Now, sometimes you'll find that what we refer to as a partial circumvalata and the others have a complete circumvalata. So it is partial in the sense that it is not covering the entire placenta, but it is just covering a portion of the fetal surface that is partial circumvalata. But where it is covering the entire placenta, then it is called a placenta circumvalata. Okay, so those are some of the commonest abnormalities that you're going to notice when you're looking at the uh, placenta itself. And even as you're doing an examination on the placenta, you need to also make sure that the lobes on the maternal surface, they are complete. And you make sure that the sulci that is actually separating those uh uh, those uh, cotyledons in there do not show any uh, portion where there is a torn cotyledon that could then mean that you have a retained uh, placenta uh, within a utero after delivery. There is another form or another abnormality that we call the vasa previa. Now with the vasa previa you will note that you can actually have uh, an umbilical cord here and then you will have a placenta and when you have a placenta that is well formed and you have membranes down here, some of the uh, blood vessels would move into the membranes. Okay, as they move into the membranes and this part of the membranes find itself onto the cervical os. Then the compression by the presenting part will cause the blood vessels here to actually break. Now, the vasa previa is more common when you have a succenturiate lobe or you have a velamentosa insertion where the cord is actually inserted in the membranes, then it moves its blood vessels to the placenta because you have this portion of the membranes which will then find itself on the cervical os allowing that presenting part now to apply pressure there and if that does then rupture it will cause an antipartum hemorrhage because the baby would still or the fetus would still be in utero and before delivery and that would culminate into hemorrhage so in most cases those are some of the abnormalities that you're going to find around Around, uh, the placenta and the placental insertion as well. It is important to note these abnormalities so that when you find out and after you have delivered the placenta and you examine the placenta, it will help you as well to understand on whether what you have delivered is a complete placenta or not. Because if you have an extra lobe and then you see vessels that are crossing over to the other side, you need to thoroughly check and make sure that you have no retained products of conception because that would then come into a postpartum hemorrhage as it is going to cause uterine atony. So those are the placenta abnormalities from me today and if you found this particular video helpful and interesting please don't hesitate to give me a thumbs up, drop me comments in the comments section. I always love to hear what you think and what you have to say and don't forget as well to share this video as much as possible. Don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit that notification button if you have not so you don't miss any of this amazing stuff that we're going to be sharing right here and as always thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next one.